welcome. Uh, we are so glad that uh, you have made it into uh, made it to the church tonight in uh, this great city of Greer. I want to thank uh, our uh, District Connection of Ministries for the work uh, that they have done. Um, this is a result of their work, uh, visioning and planning, uh, trying very desperately to uh, resource you, the local church, for those who want to take advantage of that. And you are here tonight. We plan to be here about an hour and a half with Bill uh, tonight. And uh, I am... Um, just, uh, I'm, I'm having a brain freeze, so it's after 7 o'clock. It's one minute after 7, so my brain starts to freeze up a little bit. Um, so all I'm going to do is, is thank you for being here. I hope that you will look at the books that uh, Bill has available on uh, visioning and on transition shifts. And I hope that you will ask questions. This is a great time to ask questions of, of him I'm going to ask uh, our lay leader, Michael Cheatham, to come and have an opening prayer with us. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we are grateful for this opportunity to come and to fellowship with one another and to hear a message for the life of our churches. Surround this gathering with your Holy Spirit. And in all that we hear and see and do tonight, we will sense your presence with us. Guide and uphold all of our churches. May we be the light of Jesus Christ to our communities. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' holy name and let the whole church say, Amen. Um, Kathy asked me to introduce George Donjon. He's our new convener of our uh, District Connectional Ministries. So I asked George to come up and he will introduce our guest tonight. Uh, oh, about eight, ten years ago when I was in publishing, I would ask prospective writers, why are you the one to write this book? What's your passion for this project? And I get a lot of excuses like, oh, I have a PhD from Harvard or wherever. I say, well, that doesn't tell me anything about your passion. Why are you the one to write it? Well, they wouldn't answer. They didn't know how, except a uh, select few. Bill Kemp was one of those. Bill, I said, well, tell me what your passion is for writing. It's why, are you, why are you the one to write this kind of book? And he said, well, because nobody else is writing books for small congregations. And that became this book, Holy Places, Small Spaces. Bill is a passionate, sometimes articulate, sometimes not. <laughs> and we kid each other a lot. Advocate for ministry in the midst of change. One of his other books is called The Church Transition Workbook, and it really just does try very much to help congregations get out of park and move forward. Bill's from Pittsburgh. Please. He doesn't remember Bill Mazarowski's home run in 1960 on October 12th in the bottom of the ninth inning against my beloved Yankees. But I do. <laughs> but Bill is an all-around good guy. He will not only present good stuff tonight, he will answer your questions and uh, do a good job. Afterwards, we'll have time. You can ask more questions. We have books for sale. They're not samples. They're not freebies. They are for sale. And I hope you'll buy some of them. So, Bill, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Am I, I'm on? Good, good, good. Thank you. I, I've really enjoyed being in, in uh, uh, Greenville with George and Mary. Uh, this is a beautiful city. Uh, and part of what George was sharing with me was that 50 years ago, it was not as beautiful as it is now. And uh, 
George attributed that to a particular mayor, Mayor Max Heller, and that there's, and I, I think of that in terms of someone with vision can oftentimes bring about great change. And so tonight we're going to be talking about vision and how you do that kind of visioning with your local church. Uh, that is going to be the overall theme, but I'm going to approach it from a little bit different way because I've come to believe that in the local church, we emphasize doing all the time and solving particular problems, and we sometimes fail to take the time to really sense where the Holy Spirit might be moving us and to understand our role in the kingdom of God. You know, God's got this great big kingdom that's going on, and we have a role within it. And what's important is that relationship with us and what we do together in that relationship. Not so much the problems and the stuff that we think is important. So I'm going to be challenging us throughout tonight to think in terms of a bigger picture. And uh, to do that, I want to share with you a scripture. Jesus says this at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many go through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And then after talking about watching out for consultants who come from far away and tell you things, Jesus says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. And you've probably heard that scripture in the past and applied it to yourself. Perhaps you have said to yourself, uh, salvation was an important turning point in my life. I accepted Christ and and I've got myself on the narrow road, right? Uh, I've begun to think that in our lives as Christians and as persons, there may be three or four turning points in our lives where we need to choose to go the narrow road rather than the broad way. That perhaps you can look back in your life and see a point in your life where the way everyone else was going was this way and, and you felt God called you to go this way. Perhaps you married the person that your parents did not approve of. Or perhaps uh, whatever. The, uh, you found yourself going one way when everyone else was going another way. Broad is the way, Jesus says, that leads to destruction. But narrow. And I want to apply that to churches. I think we are living in a time today. We have come today to a place where if you follow and you say, we're going to do the same thing in my church as everyone else is doing, that will lead you to destruction and closing and ineffective ministry. But if you seek to do what is the narrow calling for your particular congregation, uh, that's where life flies. Uh, and that that's uh, uh, the, the, the narrow way is hard. When I went to, when I, uh, 35 years ago or so, when I was in seminary and going out to serve my first church, I remember sensing and being told by many people, my district superintendent included, just stay within the broad fold. Methodism is a broad fold. Don't go outside the boundaries. That's where we have problems with people. Instead, stick, keep your church, you know, I was like a sheepdog, keeping my church within the broad way. And now I say unto you, narrow is the road, and few find it. Uh, there was a terrible statistic that came out recently about that uh, uh, I believe it was Lal Schaller that says something about 75% of the churches we now see will not make it to 2000, uh, 2020. 
I, I, I may have that wrong, but there is a, there is a concern that, and what I'm saying is, that's the broad way. You don't want to be stuck on the broad way. So let's, uh, Shakespeare says it this way, there is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at its flood leads on to fortune. Amid it all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and miseries. And the majority of our churches, maybe not in this district so much as, but where I am in western Pennsylvania, the majority of the churches are finding themselves stuck in the shallows. That they are meandering off, uh, they're following the broad way and they are stuck in the shallows. I want to warn you that to, to get out of this, to be unstuck, is hard. To understand your circumstances is hard. Uh, as George mentioned, I, I, 2004, was that about when, when this one came out? Uh, the, the church transition workbook says uh, getting your church into gear, it was about getting unstuck. And then I've written nine books since then. And part of the reason I've written so many books is because I've realized it wasn't so simple as I thought back here. That you have to keep on exploring further. And to understand your church and your circumstance is going to be hard. Once you understand, then action becomes easy. So do the front end. And I've begun to realize that there are three questions that enable you to do that front end. Uh, the three questions are, what is the real nature of the church? Uh, in other words, uh, is there a way of defining church with a capital C? What I mean is that, that is there a, 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 a definition for church that is simple, and true, and true everywhere, was the nature of the church. And the second one is, where is society taking us? We are like, uh, you know, back in the days when they had riverboat captains going up and down the Mississippi. The riverboat captain is a captain of this great uh, ship up and down the Mississippi would always have to be aware of the way the current was going because the current would determine where the sandbars are if you weren't aware of the currents you would end up grounded and so whether they're going upstream or downstream they were always aware of the current and we need to be aware of the current and its effect upon our uh, relationship in the ch our church where is society taking our church where is society taking our ministry? And then finally, how can we do God's will? And particularly I want to say to you that every church has a calling or a vocation from God. I think every congregation has a unique place within God's plan and God's will and that, and that you need to discover that unique vocation for your church, the narrow way. Uh, let me kind of tell you where I got these three questions. There are two business consultants named Larry Bossidy and Ram Charan, and they are the highest paid business consultants in the world today. I think. They go around, they consult with GM, uh, all these Forbes, uh, Fortune 500 companies, they go in, and the Fortune 500 companies, they'll meet with the, with the boards and they'll say, your company is stuck. And they ask three questions whenever they go into a board meeting uh, and get paid the big bucks. The three questions they ask is, first of all, what's the nature of the business that you're in? And uh, they press the, uh, the CEOs to think in terms of the actual nature of the business they're in. And the second question is, what are the external factors? What, is the, what are the outside pressures upon the market where you're in? And where is it taking you? And the third question they ask is, how do you make money in this market? And uh, of course, we're not concerned with making money in the church, but I think that translates to how do you do the will of God? 
And, uh, and uh, we are every day trying to figure out how to market the church to the postmodern generation. And unless we are considering those external factors, we are in trouble. But all that's based upon understanding what's the nature of the church. So with that in mind, I'm going to go to the, to, I'm going to, we're going to spend some time talking about each of the three questions. But what I really want to encourage you to do is to not take my answers, but instead to go back to your church and form a small group. Get together with two or three other people, or even by yourself, and prayerfully consider these three questions and apply them to your church for the next 40 days. Or perhaps when you meet in church council, deal with one of these three questions for the next three months. And, or take your time, whatever you feel is, will work in your situation, wrestle with the questions and see how your answers come out. Because to understand is hard. Once you understand, action becomes easy. So each of these three questions, I think, believes, uh, I think gives, has an application that falls out of it very naturally. And so the first question is, what is the nature of the church? And the application that comes out of it is, how can we design our life together so the church becomes what Christ had in mind. Do you all realize that Jesus invented church? Did, did you ever think about that way? Jesus invented church. And he had a particular reason, I think, in mind when he invented it. Uh, he didn't speak about it a whole lot. There's a few places where the Greek word ecclesia is used within the gospels. But everything he did in terms of the day-to-day -day ministry was preparation for church. And so I believe that Jesus had a design in mind. And there's a reason why I have Steve Jobs with the iPad here. How many of you own an iPad? How many of you own an iPhone? <laughs> OK. Uh, how many of you are entirely Mac in terms of phone, computer, uh, <laughs> iPod, whatever? There's a reason why I have Steve Jobs. It's because part of his genius was to design the device so that it felt good, so that the way it operated was intuitive. He took the computer off of the table, which you had to read a manual to use, and made it into the iPad which you carry with you. And half the time when I go to workshops like this, I'll see two or three people my age and older using the iPad to take notes. Uh, I don't see anyone today doing that, but there's a reason why. Because he somehow designed it so that it felt good. OK? And when something is designed right, it serves the purpose without creating any barriers to that purpose happening. In other words, part of what Steve Jobs' mantra when he, when he was uh, 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 running Apple was, don't put any barriers in the way of people using the computer the way that they need to use it. So the iPad makes intuitive sense, in fact, I bought one of the first iPads in the April that, after it came out, and I don't have it anymore because my wife has taken it. And my wife is a Luddite. She is a person that doesn't like computers. She, she doesn't have an email address, uh, but she has the iPad with her right now. I'm sure she probably has it clutched in her hands right now. <laughs> I could not pry that from her to take it to South Carolina. That's because it's so of its design. What if we designed the church so it became what Christ had in mind? My gosh, what would happen would be that we'd have Pentecost in Greenville. 
You, you catch that sense? On the day of Pentecost, people could not do without what church was. Now, that's why it's so important. The passage of Scripture that's been, that Mary has been sharing with each of the charge conferences is Acts 2, 34 through 43 or yeah, to the end of the, end of the chapter. That scripture is the one I found myself two years ago beginning to meditate upon to answer this question. And everything I'm going to share with you about this question, I believe, comes out of that scripture. If you're going to define church, that is probably the first scripture you go to. And then you begin to unpack it. And there are some other scriptures you can go to with it. Uh, but that is where I begin. And so with that in mind, I want to give you a definition for church. Part of my problem is that if you go to, I think I have it on the handout, that uh, if you go to the dictionary and look up the definition for church, what's it say? Something about, uh, uh, yeah, the, the diction, oh, I don't have it here. Okay. Anyways, so if, if you look up a dictionary definition of church, um, no, uh, but anyway, so you all know what the dictionary definition of church is because it's what you live by normally. The dictionary definition of church says something about a church as a religious organization with a building, uh, an ordained pastorate, and, uh, and uh, it's always after money. That may not be, <laughs> but, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> but that's kind of what the dictionary definition is, something of that sort. Uh, it's an institution, it's an organization, it is a, uh, a structure that has financial needs and building needs and UMWs and all these things, that is what church is in the dictionary. You go back to Acts chapter 2, 34, and you read there what church is. And I've kind of rolled that around in my mind, you know how you tumble rocks? Any of you ever tumble rocks? I've kind of rolled that around my mind, and I've rolled it around my mind until I, say, until I came up with this short way of saying it. Uh, church is a gathering of people for prayer, study, and worship who relate to each other and to the world as Christ desires. So, and there's a word in there that's a small word that you may think doesn't make a difference, but it does. It's the word relate. Church is a group of people who gather for, for prayer, study, uh, uh, worship, and they relate with each other as Christ desires. And then they go out into the world and they relate with the world as Christ desires. And relationship is the key part of that definition. And what I, in, in a little bit, I'm going to talk with you about the postmodern world. And what I want to say to you about the postmodern world is that the central uh, core value of the postmodern world is relationships. That when you talk to people who have invested themselves in the new culture that's coming on, what they will talk about is relationships. If you, want, if you doubt that, what's the most common, well, let me tell you what it is. Facebook. What's Facebook all about? Relationships. It's, 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 the, it's the thing that, that Facebook does. Builds relationships, you know, it, it allows you to interact with relationships. And maybe not all of you are on Facebook, and you all, we all have different feelings about how we like it or don't like it, but it's part of the culture. And if our definition of church doesn't involve relationship, I think we're misunderstanding it. But the other thing is that if you look at what Jesus does throughout the Gospels, everything he does throughout the Gospels involves relationships. He's constantly working on relationships and teaching the disciples how to do relationships. It is, it is woven into everything he did. 
So I think the definition of the church has to have relationship at its center. So you may come up with a better way of defining church and, and feel free to. Do the work, though, of question number one. And once you begin to, to look at this, and I begin to see that there's certain key concepts that exist. And the key concepts are fellowship. And uh, can you have church without fellowship? You notice that one of the things that Jesus did was he didn't say to the disciples, here is the content. I want you to go out and give people this book and have them understand what I'm teaching here and that's all you need to do. Uh, Jesus does not say to people, okay, here are four spiritual laws, sign off on them and that's all you need. Instead, he says, go make disciples and he pulls people into groups and in those groups they have fellowship. And uh, so fellowship's key. Prayer is, 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 is really key. Uh, what is uh, one of the definitions that Jesus gives for church is he says, my father's house is a house of prayer. That's one of, you know, the alternative definition that Jesus gives is my father's house is a house of prayer. So prayer is key. Uh, study, and notice I say study, I don't say sermons. Because the thing that we, okay, I'm in, I'm in trouble with those of you that are Reformation people. Because the Reformation said the preaching thing is the important thing. That's why the pulpits are really high in some of the, uh, the uh, churches that are uh, post-Reformation, big high pulpits. Preaching's the important thing. This one's fairly high. I think I want to say to you that my definition of church emphasizes study over preaching. You may not get that same place, but that's where I find myself. Uh, and finally, mission and witness. Uh, mission and witness are important because uh, the church has to relate to the world the way that Christ desires. And those two are the same thing. We did a really dumb thing in the United Methodist Church back in the 70s. One of the things, you know, what we did in the, in the 70s or so, and we still have it, is we have created committees in the church, and we have one committee for evangelism, and we have another committee for mission. Isn't that silly? Because <laughs> how do you separate those two? You can't have mission without witness. You can't have witness without mission. The two belong together. They are, they are inseparable. And, and, um, and the other thing we've done is we've said, well, the mission committee handles mission instead of realizing that mission is the work of the whole church. A church can't say, well, I'm a church, but I'm not involved in mission or witness. Uh, so... Now, these four things, it's interesting because they're exactly the things that I found were involved with spiritual passion. And I, I was just talking with Kathy about Natural Church Development, which is a program that you have been invested in as a conference. Uh, Natural Church Development has you look at what are the, what's the minimum factor, what's the barrier, what's keeping your church from becoming alive and uh, Christian Schwartz lists eight things, but what I found in Western Pennsylvania Conference, where I'm from, in the Pittsburgh area, is that half of the churches have low spiritual passion. You know, you know, how, you know how you know that your church has low spiritual passion? Uh, this is the time to give a commercial for Ezekiel's bones, but uh, when when people are glad to see a dog run down the aisle because it's the most exciting thing that's happened in the church that, that year. <laughs> uh, there are churches that have such low spiritual passion that they do church fights just to get some excitement. It's not that they really want to fight with the pastor or whatever, they have, just to get some excitement. Uh, low spiritual passion also is shown in a lack of willingness to try new things. We've never done it that way before is usually the words of a church with low spiritual passion. 
But the real evidence of low spiritual passion is the fact that a church will pray on Sunday mornings but have no expectation that those prayers will be answered. So every church prays, right? At some point, don't you pray? But not every church has people who expect those prayers to come true. It's the expectation that marks spiritual passion. Every church in some way witnesses. Only churches with spiritual passion witness with joy. Uh, a lot of churches witness negatively. Low spiritual passion also comes down to worship in which you can't tell if the him or the pastor or whatever is happening has to do with heaven or hell <laughs> by looking at what's going on. Joy and sorrow are not distinguishable. And I want to say to you that in inspiring worship, there is a lineup between passion, uh, I mean, between the emotional content and, and what's happening in worship. So when we talk about heaven, there's joy. When we talk about hell, there's a real anxiety. When we talk about anything else, there's, there's a sense in which the emotional content is connected with the, uh, with the item. And uh, that's part of what you see. Uh, spiritual passion uh, is a, something that you have to, to, to look at in your church and say, how can we get enough spiritual passion? Because if you don't have enough spiritual passion, it's like flying an airplane without any gas in it. The airplane may look great, but without any gas, it's not going to go there. I hope they put enough gas in the plane that I'm flying back in. Uh, that would, <laughs> you know, and that's low spiritual passion is a real concern. As I wrestle with, it's a dangerous thing to ask a question and then to keep on asking a question past all the simple answers. Because if we're asking this question, what is church? Well, what's more church? 200 people gathered in a sanctuary like this on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, or 20 groups of about 10 or so gathered in scattered places throughout the community for prayer and study and fellowship. Which is more church? <laughs> now, I hope that's a challenging question to you. I mean, I mean, I, I know you, you know, but which is more church? And you might feel very definitely, yes, here, 200 people right here is more church. Well, be, be ready to defend that. If you believe that way, work it back to Scripture. Discover where it is. What? Both and, yeah. That's where the power is, I think. The power is in both and. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing, you know, part of what, what I began to realize that never occurred to me until I, I but part of what I began to realize as a pastor was that there were a lot of nursing homes that did not have any type of fellowship or service or whatever within that nursing home. Then I began to realize that a lot of the uh, 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 neatest experiences that I've had with groups have been in places like coffee shops and, and that some of the places where you have a Christian fellowship beginning where perhaps there's not enough finances or whatever to put a building there you can, go at, you can go to Starbucks and, and have a group meet. And some of these, like Panera's, uh, is willing to give you a room if you ask for it. That's all you have to do is ask for a room. And, and talk about how difficult it is to pay for this when we can ask for a room for free from Panera's. But you have to be willing to ask for, you have to, willing to be willing to invite 
your friends and make relationships in order to have people in Paneros to gather around that table with you. So it goes back to relationship. And it's hard to get away without relationship. As I wrestled with this, just recently I began to realize that an important part of church in defining what the nature of church is, is to realize that Jesus never did healings without involving the community. And you go through, you look at the various miracles that take place in, Jesus, in the Gospels. Jesus seems to be almost intentionally setting things up so there's always a crowd right there. Uh, or that, uh, you know, the woman comes up and touches him, the back hem of his garment, and he turns around and says, everybody notice this woman. <laughs> and suddenly a community is involved. Jesus teaches his disciples to go out and do healing and, uh, and, and ministry in scattered places. And he doesn't tell his disciples, here is the secret thing that you will hand on one by one to people. He instead gathers people together. The disciples go out, they, they, they gather groups and homes, and uh, everything happens in community. And this is where uh, we are strong. We live in a world today where everyone's looking for community. And if the church can be an authentic community, we've got it made. So when people say, why do you go to church? And your first answer is, well, because John gives great sermons. Uh, that's the wrong answer. <laughs> if you say to them, I go to church because I need that community that's gathered there. And that community has become a place of healing for me. And if the focus of the church can be upon the healing that occurs when the community gathers, that shifts things. That leads us to the, to the next question. And first question was easy. Second question is much harder. Because we realize that society is taking us someplace and the application that runs out of that question, where is society taking us, is how can we make your church relevant uh, in this changing world to the neighborhood, to the people of the neighborhood? How can you make, uh, uh, have your church remain relevant in the midst of change all around you? And um, if you don't remain relevant, the church dies and closes up. It's just, that's the market economy. You can forestall it by having an endowment. You can forestall it by, by uh, uh, good stewardship. But unless the church is relevant, it soon closes. So the question becomes very important. Um, <clears throat> You're halfway there, not in terms of tonight, but in terms of uh, if you wrestle with this question, you're going to pretty soon feel that you are like this fish, halfway between two bowls. Because there is the old world. Uh, I go back to when I graduated from seminary in 1979. There's this old world that was one way. And now we have a new world that's come upon us. And all of us are halfway there. And the fish cannot choose to turn around and go backwards. It may look easier to go back to the old bowl. But you are halfway to the new one. And you better get ready for that new bowl. With that in mind, I want to show you what would probably be the scariest... Uh, oh, oh. Uh, there you go. Let, me, let me show you the scariest slide. This is the scariest slide in the, in the group. For some of you, this will be the scariest slide. How many of you uh, have watched the TV show Friends? It's no longer on, it was, uh, but how many of you have watched the TV show Friends? How many of you, uh, keep your hands up, how many of you have watched more than uh, 10 episodes of Friends? Okay, a couple of you have watched more than 10 episodes of Friends. Good. 
Good, yeah. Okay. How many of you really like it? Really like friends? Okay, good, good, good. That, that show um, is worth finding on reruns and watching if you haven't watched it. Because what happens in that show is you have a group of, of uh, 20, late 20s, early 30s people, people in that maybe 30-year-old age range. And every episode, one of them has a problem. And when they have the problem, do they go to their local pastor and consult the person who has a degree in pastoral counseling? No. <laughs> No, they go to the local coffee shop and they gather with their friends and, they, have, and they, they wrestle through their problems together in the community at that coffee shop. They don't have experts. They don't, they don't even go to therapists or anybody. You know, they always have problems and every episode there's a problem. None of the episodes is the problem ever solved outside of the community that's in the coffee shop. The other thing you notice about them is that they're a fairly diverse group of people. Uh, Ross has a degree in a paleontology, yeah. <laughs> he's, a, he's a person who's got a college education and is really bright. And, and then you have Phoebe, who is somewhere else. <laughs> Well, you know, by the way, the actress that played her is really intelligent. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, you also have this big difference in terms in Joey. Joey's a, an actor. You know, he is just in a different place. And, and there's a big gap in terms of earning between them. But the material things that I, I, most of us grew up in a fairly class stratified society. In other words, the houses on the block where I grew up, everyone earned about the same amount. The friends of my parents were all probably about the same financial circumstance. We grew up in a stratified world. The friends don't have material stratification and, it's not, and, and all of them would say it doesn't matter to them. How they choose their friends are not based upon money. Material things are not the source of their, their world view. And they live in a world that's networked, not hierarchical. And so they have a hard enough time grasping why the pastor is up there and the laity are down here, let alone why we have a DS above the pastor and a bishop above the DS. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, for them, the world is not hierarchical, it's network. It's egalitarian. It flows this way. Knowledge flows this way in today's world. It doesn't flow up and down uh, a, uh, a hierarchy. So that's a different world. What really happens with that different world is that people have a shift in focus. It's not that they are a better or a worse culture than what the modern world was. The postmodern world has had a shift in focus. Did you catch that? I think, oh, no. I think that's one of the neater slides. <laughs> Here you go. And <laughs> Instead of being focused on the front flower, now you're focused on the back flower. Postmoderns focus on a different thing. And I want to tell you that postmodern culture is not a matter of age. I am more postmodern than my children are. I, I say that for real. My son is not, is hardly, you know, he doesn't really do postmodern. <laughs> He grumbles about it. You know, he's just stuck, he's a stick in the mud. Um, <laughs> I say he takes after my wife. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. 
Absolutely, but just, you know, he's not postmodern in his attitude as much as I think I am. I, I see the world as networks and relationships. I have a hard time with hierarchy. Different world. Uh, so one of the things we have to get out of is the preference blame game saying, oh no, I can't handle that. We have to get into this new understanding of what the world is. And there's good news and bad news about this new world. Part of the, what we have noticed as bad news is that since 19, uh, actually since 1968, our denomination has been on a 1.5% decline per year. And what this really is, I'm not saying that there's something wrong with United Methodism. There's something wrong with church as we currently organize it and think about it. Because what has really happened is that throughout America, all of church uh, gatherings are on this 1.5% per year decline. With some exceptions here. Uh, the churches that are bigger than 200 are doing better. 200 and, and worship service on Sunday. And the churches that are smaller than 50 are doing about the same. So what I say is that small churches tend to be recession-proof, and larger churches tend to be, uh, some of them are growing very well. And, but most of you are probably in the middle somewhere. And if you go back and you look at your church statistics and you look at where you were in 1982, if you had 50 in attendance in your worship place, you probably have 35 in attendance now, or 31 in attendance now. Unless the preacher lies on the number. And, uh, and uh, if you had 150 in worship in 1982, you probably have around 95 in worship now. And Mary's here sweating bullets because she realizes that a church that went from 150 in worship in 1982 to 90 in worship today can no longer afford a full-time pastor. That's the reality. So this, that's part, and why I want to say this, this is not a problem with the pastor you have or a problem with the United Methodist denomination uh, this is happening among conservative churches as well as non-conservative. The difference is, is that there are more large churches that are conservative. And so we say, oh, they're doing better. Well, the churches your size that are conservative are not doing better. Let's see where that, that is. What's the sum of this is, is that this past Sunday, only about 18% of Americans were in church this past Sunday. Until recently, we thought it was much better. Now, this is a fairly recent statistic. What happened was that uh, it used to be uh, Gallup would go through the statistics for each church in a community and then divide the number of people in the community to come up with a figure. And they thought there was like 30% or 35% going to church on Sunday. And then what they realize is that every pastor lies. And so what, <laughs> what they did was they started calling people randomly and saying, were you in church this past weekend? And only 18% said, yes, I was in church this weekend. Okay. Confession's good for the soul. <laughs> now, this is where we are. And to make things even worse, about 76 million Americans never go to church. So what's happened of that 18%, you know, there are people who say they are regular churchgoers and come twice a month or once a month, right? This is probably more so where I am than here, but it's going to be that way here soon. In other words, you are in the South where things have held on, but it's coming your way. So this is what's happening. And what has happened is that this, this is all related to 
the postmodern culture's dislike of hierarchy and uh, and uh, uh, the dis uh, desire for relationships, and so they come to church and they hear about doctrine instead of about relationships. All these things are related to why there's this been this decline and this shortage of people coming to church. So now we come into a world in which it's like dominoes. The changes in the postmodern culture has causes changes in the size of your church. And because your church perhaps shrinks, it can't afford a full-time pastor, and so there's a change in structure. And as you go through a change in structure, you should ought to rethink what the mission and the value of your church is, what it's trying to do within this particular place where it's at. One of the things that's coming out of this that uh, uh, somebody talked to me at this morning is that we're beginning to realize that we need to form clusters of churches in areas where, where before you had five churches, each with their own pastor. Now we're looking at putting five churches together in a cluster and maybe having one supervising elder and one uh, and a couple part-time local pastors and a couple lay uh, CLMs, certified lay ministers, and doing more ministry with less salary. The way the British do it, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is, yeah, so you hear that in Britain, and they've had that structure since Wesley pretty much, where they have formed clusters, and now they are ready for the postmodern world that has taken over Europe uh, pretty solidly. Now what's happened is, is that uh, uh, they're doing, okay, you may say we're giving up the pastor of our own, but what you're gaining is a missional grouping where you work together. You may not have your own youth group, you may have a shared youth group, you may not have your own confirmation class, you may have a shared confirmation class. And the, the, the trick is to do it for missional reasons, for the value of remaining relevant to a postmodern culture, rather than to do it for financial reasons. Because financial reasons have nothing to do with what church is. Mission and witness have everything to do with what church is. So if we can restructure our church so it can be more missional, then we need to do that. So it's not all bad news, that fact that we are like a fish halfway between two bowls of water. It's good news. It's new opportunities. But it's a little bit scary. The big thing that postmoderns ask from us is that we be authentic. That's a, a major word when you ask, if you ask a postmodern who's not going to church why they're not going to church, sometimes they will say, because church is full of hypocrites. If you ask a person who is a postmodern who is going to church why they go to church, they will say, because I have an authentic Christian experience there. So authenticity is an important thing. And how do you become authentic? Uh, you become authentic by being faithful to the mission that you have as a church. You become authentic by being transparent and loving in your relationships with each other. And I think the shift that's happening is we used to say the most important thing about our church is to keep it theologically right. And now we're beginning to realize the most important thing about our church is to make sure the relationships function in a way that Christ would desire in the midst of our church. And that we relate with the world the way that Christ desires. So you see that shift in thinking. And if you can undergo that shift in thinking, you're, you're, you're home free. And being passionate about God. Uh, there's no room in today's world for a religion without passion. I mean, just does not, there is, uh, 
there are many churches that have religion without passion and they're dying. They're going to be gone. Uh, and one of the things that I did in my churches uh, is that we would every year do a passion play. And that was an interesting thing because I remember when I first started doing this, having passion plays in the Easter season, celebrating the death and resurrection of Christ in a dramatic way. When I first started doing this, I began, uh, one of the, 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 the music director's daughter, who was maybe eight or so, came and said, what's this about passion? I thought passion was naughty. You know, she was thinking in terms of what was on TV. I thought passion was naughty. And, uh, and we had to say no. Passion's all about what the people experienced who walked with Jesus to the cross and then came to the tomb the next day, uh, on the next Sunday. That's what passion's about. Uh, and and you, you can recover that passion in the church. Um, that's where we need to be. Uh, people today don't need a building. One of the rising movements of today's church is uh, house churches. This is a picture of a church that meets, a house church that meets in Nacogdoches. What they have is they have uh, Nacogdoches, Texas. Uh, and uh, in Nacogdoches, Texas, uh, uh, this group of people meet in the home of the woman in blue in the middle. And uh, uh, they have, they gather for a meal, uh, potluck, uh, on Wednesday night. Uh, and they have the meal, they have singing and uh, uh, with a guitar, they have uh, 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 scripture, and study, and they have communion. It lasts about two, two and a half hours, and about half the people there are youth, and the youth are not bored. Okay? The kids are so excited, they're bringing their friends to house church. And what's happening in that house church is that they, every once in a while, have to spall off. And so one of the leaders has to go out and say, I'm going to start a house church in my house. And uh, uh, so uh, when I was there a year ago, May, uh, they were establishing a house church on a local campus in the dorm room of one of the local campuses with two of the young people that were involved with this house church. They were carrying it to their campus where they were going to school. Yeah, that, now, that house church that they form on the campus is probably not going to last very long because uh, it's a temporary thing, but it happens because these kids have learned how to do it at the home and now are carrying it to the campus. And it's Methodist. <laughs> Did I tell you that? This is United Methodist. Oh, uh, so... <laughs> House church is a growing and significant trend. That doesn't mean that you have to get rid of your building. It does mean, though, that you may have to look at your building and say, how can we, what's God calling us to use this building for? You know, we still want to meet here on Sunday because that where we, that's just where we feel comfortable worshiping. What else are we going to do with it? In God's will, you know? So, I, I do a couple slides here real quickly to say about red herrings. You know what a red herring is? It's something that you follow thinking that's what's important and it turns out to be wrong. One of the things people always will say is those churches that are modern and hep and have contemporary worship, those worship, those are the churches that are growing. Not really. Um, you shouldn't do contemporary worship unless you have the the is calling to do it. You have to be true and authentic to yourself and to what God has gifted you to do. So I, I want to be careful. But be careful when someone says, we got to do this because it's the modern thing to do. 
Eastman Kodak was one of the most innovative and modern companies of the last century. How many of you, any of you have Eastman Kodak stock today? Yeah, you're lucky. <laughs> My father had Eastman Kodak stock. <laughs> uh, uh, it's not worth anything. <laughs> it's gone. Uh, and Eastman Kodak innovated. We're always modern. They kept up with everything except for what happened was digital photography came along and they began to say, well, we're not going to do that. <laughs> digital photography, what, is, what does that have to do with us? We're in the film business. We make Kodachrome. Okay? The last roll of Kodachrome was processed about two years ago. It's gone. I'm Paul Simon and myself are people who love Kodachrome. <laughs> but I have to admit it since I, uh, I have not shot a whole lot of film lately. And I used to shoot a lot of film. Now, uh, so... Yeah, we're in the picture business. And the memory business, remember Kodak had this ad where they, yeah, Kodak had this ad that said, we're in the memory business. Uh, that might have helped them if they had thought about it. Uh, what happened instead, uh, Polaroid is another one that's gone. But you know what Polaroid did about uh, just before it died? What Polaroid did was they came out with a little camera that uh, took a picture digitally and then printed it on a little three by four piece of paper and spat that piece of paper out. If you turn it sideways, it looked just like the old fashioned Polaroid, spitting a piece of paper out. And this is exactly what many churches are doing. They're saying, okay, uh, digital has come, so we're going to go ahead and do exactly what we do, only they will modernize it. And just modernizing it doesn't do it. You have, to, you have to adjust to where the world is taking you. It may not be simple. It's a harder question to answer. Where is the world taking the church? It's not a matter of just becoming more modern. It's a matter of becoming authentic and faithful to your calling and your mission. Um, it's a red herring to say, oh, we're just going to digitalize. Uh, innovation... I want to give you the definition of innovation. Innovation involves seeing a need in the world and then finding a gospel-based answer to meet that need. So in other words, you see a need in the world, and you say, how is the gospel calling us to answer that need? And if you can innovate in that way, your church will have real value. Uh, it's a matter of uh, finding a gospel answer to your neighbor's needs, and you have to understand what their needs are. One of the NCD uh, uh, factors is need-based evangelism. And uh, need-based evangelism says, we're not going to tell you what we want to tell you, we're going to tell you what you need to hear, what your need is. We're going to witness according to your need. Uh, so... And there, there's a reason, this is Ben Rothensberger, who is the quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Last year, I would have said this with pride. This year, we lost our first two games. We won the game last week, but we lost our first two games. And for the first part of the season, Ben Rothensberger was the most sacked quarterback in the NFL. It was like there was, there was nothing between him and the defensive line. <laughs> and, and what happens, it, it, there are two things to draw from this picture. First of all, when Ben Roethlisberger stops having a peripheral vision and seeing who's coming to him from his blind side, he's going to get sacked. You know, that's, 
So the church has to have peripheral vision. We have to see out in the world around us. But the second thing I want you to draw from this is that how does the quarterback throw an effective pass? Does he throw the ball to where the person is? No, he throws the ball to where he hopes the person will be, where his receiver is supposed to be in the future. So what we need to do in the church is to stop throwing the ball where, we're, where the receiver was and start throwing it to where the receiver will be. We have to start thinking ahead to where culture is taking us. What Ben does every once in a while, he'll throw a ball to where he thinks the receiver is going to be and it'll be an interception. He threw more interceptions last year than anyone else. <laughs> so, so, you know, he got that, he's still a great quarterback. And the church is still a great church. We have to learn to put the ball where the people are going to be. Uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. The peripheral vision of the church. It, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you got that guy that's protecting your blind side. Now, this gets me one of my pet peeves. My pet peeves is that we tend to think that pastors are supposed to have the vision for the church. Pastors very rarely have the peripheral vision to see outside in the world, the community around. The purpose of United Methodist pastors, what United Methodist pastors must do is itinerate. In other words, they have to go from church to church as the bishop and Mary sends them to different churches, and they go into each local church and they say, this is how we worship Christ, this is how we worship God, this is what we do in United Methodism everywhere, I bring to you the general picture. Now, laity and the congregations, you should be able to say this, you have a, con you have a, you have a, a complementary task. The task of laity is to locate. Clergy itinerate, they go around place to place. Laity locate. And when laity locate, what they do is they say, yes, pastor, but in this place, in this particular place, the mission is to feed the homeless. In this particular place, the mission is to have an after-school program you as laity have the peripheral, and so you're like the guy behind Ben who prevents him from being sacked, hopefully, by working in the teamwork. Obviously, your, your laity are like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> are your lady letting you get sacked a lot? <laughs> you know, the danger of all United Methodist pastors have tunnel vision. You lay people have to break us out and to say, look, here is the community. That's your job. Your job is to locate. See? That, that will preach a charge conference, one. And I've, I've been trying to, one of the things I intensely believe is that every local church has a soul. And you have a soul, your, your local church has a soul and that soul is yours. God has blessed your local church with a soul. The pastors come and go. Your soul remains here in your local church. Key lay people in your church come and go. But the soul remains. And I cannot give you a picture of the soul, but I can tell you where it's located. The soul of your local church, of your church, is located at the intersection of three circles. You have a great big green circle that is the kingdom of God. God is, is bringing about his kingdom upon this world. The kingdom of God is here among you. Your church, 
overlaps that circle. Okay? The kingdom of God doesn't all overlap your church. Your church has a lot of it that doesn't overlap with the kingdom of God. Many things happen in your church which have no relevance to the kingdom of God, right? Let's just admit it, okay? And then there's the world. And the circle of the kingdom of God overlaps the world because God is so committed to the world. God so loved the world that he has committed his kingdom to overlap the world. Now where the kingdom of God and your church overlap the world, that little triangle where all three are lined up, that's where your soul is. And what happens is if your church begins to say, no, we're going to withdraw from the world, we don't want to get involved with the world, that's those people out there, then what happens is the overlap between you and God gets smaller and your soul gets smaller. Your soul is diminished. If you increase your relationship with the world without increasing your relationship with God, your passion, your spiritual passion, then your soul gets smaller too. What you have to do is both increase your relationship with God and your relationship with the world. And that's how to be a great soul. But your, your church has a soul, and it's that overlap place. That's where your soul is located. I hope that works for some of you. Venn diagrams, I like Venn diagrams. Not everyone does, but that's my drawing. That leads us finally to the third question. By the way, that second question I think is the hardest one for most churches, for most people. The third question is the one that's the most fun, I think. The third question is, you, is where you return and you back and you say, the narrow way is the way that leads to God's will and to heaven. The broad way of doing what everyone else is doing is where we are led astray. So what particular thing does God have for my church? What is the particular answer that you will come up that won't make any sense to anyone else in our churches? And you know you're on the right track when what you're doing in your church makes no sense to the church a block away. Okay? Uh, so, your vocation. What specific vocation does God have for your church? And uh, I want you to think in terms of the Wizard of Oz. Okay, remember the story of the Wizard of Oz? And, and what you, this is a picture of your church council meeting. Okay? Okay. As your church leadership gets together, everyone in the room has a different personal desire for mission and vision and what Christianity means to them. But you're together on the way that Christ is leading your church. Now, think of the Wizard of Oz. Each of these four characters, four and a half, have a different mission. The goal of the tin man is to get a heart. The goal of the lion is to get courage. The goal of Dorothy is to get home. <laughs> they all have a different mission or goal, and yet they're all together on the yellow brick road. And I want to say to you that the yellow brick road represents the vocational way of your church. You may have someone who believes so firmly in uh, one particular aspect of the church, music. I, you know, I have people that are entirely dedicated to music. That's their particular personal mission, but they can coordinate on the church's mission as a whole. We don't have to get everyone to agree. We instead have to get everyone to go on the same road together. You know what the, uh, the uh, 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 Salman Rushdie just recently wrote a little book on, on what uh, the Wizard of Oz is all about. And what Salman Rushdie says is that the Wizard of Oz is all about friendship. That's really what that movie is all about, is friendship. And uh, what's the church about? It's a fellowship of friends. Uh, the movie The Hobbit's the same way. 
all together even though we have different goals. And with that in mind, I want to give you an illustration. And this one may or may not work for you. If it doesn't work for you, I've got another illustration in one of my other books. But I think what we are now in is stuck. Why? How we are stuck. Going back to the theme of the thing, how we are stuck is that we're stuck in the roundabout. Now, you probably don't have roundabouts around here. Uh, up in Boston, there are, okay, you have roundabouts? Okay, good, good. You call them roundabouts or you call them rotaries? Traffic circles, okay. Traffic circles, okay. Talk about... Okay, you got some in Columbus? Yeah, yeah. So, you've all been on a traffic circle. I, I encountered them in England. Like you, I did a, a, a pulpit exchange in England, and you suddenly have to realize that the way you navigate from place to place in England is you drive to the first traffic circle, or roundabout, and you take a right, and you go around the roundabout until and you pass exits. And, um, and you look for your exit. And then you get off on the exit and then you take that road to the next roundabout. And then you go around, you look for exits until you find your exit and you go to the next roundabout. And to me it's very efficient. It's a lot more efficient than the interstate system that we have here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right, right, yeah. And that's exactly what happens is that we go around and we say, oh, is that the right one? Is that the right one? And so what, what's happened with the church is, back when I was a young pastor, and I was told to stick to the broad way. Part of what I was told was, every United Methodist Church has this, 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 this. And we were supposed to, in fact, the old discipline used to say, every United Methodist Church shall have. And there was a list of things that every church had to have. And the idea was that if you were a United Methodist Church and you did all these things and had all these programs, uh, then you were a good church. And that was the way in which we got to where we are now. And now we're in a roundabout, and the world has changed, and that's no longer true. What is true now is that every church has to choose an exit. And I want to share with you there are four exits that I've kind of come up with. This is not something that's written in stone. This is something that instead I believe is for today. Now, when I look at the church world picture today, in my mind, I come up with four exits. And if you go around and you look at the first exit, and you say, no, maybe not that one. You get to the second exit, and you say, well, no, maybe not that one. You go around, you do the four exits, and you can't go back the way you came in because you're like the fish halfway between two bowls. You can't go back the one-way road. You go around, and as you go around again, you face the same four exits. And the GPS on your dash says, recalculating, right? So you go around the, the roundabout one more time. And I think a lot of churches are going around the roundabout because it takes less spiritual passion to stay on the roundabout than it does to get off an exit. And if you try to discern which of these four exits is the exit for your church, you're on the path towards uh, discovering your particular vocation. And I want you to think in terms of it as broad path, as not broad pathways, as narrow pathways, but as pathways rather than goals. You're not establishing a goal for your church. Instead, what you're doing is you're saying, this path feels like the way God is calling us to go now so that we get off the roundabout and get unstuck and go in some particular direction. And the four pathways are, are this. There is a pathway that involves taking pride in your legacy as a church. This is kind of the older pathway that involves caring for your members and caring for your building. So that's the first exit. 
Second axiom involves adapting your church so that you can share the gospel with the next generation, making whatever changes are necessary so that you have an authentic witness in the next generation. That's the second pathway. The third pathway is to entirely give yourselves into acts of love and service for your neighbor so that your church is focused almost entirely upon mission and witness out in the community. And the fourth pathway involves making your church a, a, a church of such quality in the region that people will drive by other churches in order to come to yours. See what I mean? There's, there are four pathways, and you're all kind of saying, eh, I haven't heard the path I want to get off on yet. <laughs> but what I'm saying is you're going to go around the roundabout a couple more times until you say, yeah, maybe this path is our path. So the, uh, let's look at this in terms of the way in which the path is going. One path is going towards legacy. Another path is going towards adaptation to the postmodern world. A third path is going towards loving your neighbor. And the fourth path is going towards quality. See how those are? Now just for fun, I'm going to give those paths, those exits, names like you would see on the freeway. Okay? So let's go back to the roundabout, and this time we're going to get off on one of those paths. Exit number one is Chapel Lane. It's a slow, meandering path. It's very familiar. It involves fixing your buildings and caring for your members. And this is the path, this is the exit where the Comfort Inn is located. Okay? And just given our own druthers, a lot of us would get off on path number one, except for the fact that we've been told by many people, and we're just beginning to believe, is that the legacy path leads eventually to the church's closing. Okay? There are churches who I think God is calling to enter into hospice. In other words, God may be, you know, as you meet together with a group of people and pray about and say, what exit is our church being called to go off on? You may come back and say, you know, God is calling us to close. Realizing that, it's very similar. I wrote a book for people who are terminally ill. And I, I'd like to, if I get time sometime, to write a book for churches that are terminally ill, churches that are on that hospice path. Because there are things that you need to do to do. This is not the same path as going down the drain. This is the path of, of intentionally trying to do what is necessary to do the will of God even though your church is going to close? How do you do the will of God even though your church is going to close? And one of the things you have to do is you have to stop thinking about your building as an idol that you're maintaining and start thinking about it as a, as a gift that someday, when it's right, you're going to give this gift to some other group. And maybe to another church, and maybe to another Christian organization, and maybe to another mission group, sometime you're going to give your building away. This is your legacy. You see where that word legacy comes in? At some time, but the conference is not going to tell you when to do that. If you're faithful to God's will upon the path, you'll know when it's time. And you'll, give, you'll maintain your building for the purpose of giving it as, an, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a gift to some other group that may do something with it that you can't do. See what I mean? It's a hard thing to say, but that's what lies along this path. 
it may not lie in the near future. It may lie a ways down the road. But you, you prepare yourself and you start thinking about what are some appropriate things that we can do. What, my DS complains all the time about the fact that churches decline until there's two or three people left and then they, 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 the, the last two or three people leave and they turn off the light and they say, conference, the building is now yours. I don't know if you have that. And my DS says, I don't want any of those buildings. By the time the last two or three people leave that building, it's not worth a thing. It's an eyesore, it's a problem. If you're intentional and you're saying, how can I do the will of God? You don't want to leave your building as an eyesore. You want to leave it as a gift that someone can use. You don't want it to become a furniture store. You don't want it to become uh, a bar. We have churches in Pittsburgh that have become bars. Uh, (laughs) You don't want that to happen to your church, do you? So if you're on this pathway, you think intentionally about how can I give my church as a gift? You also look for ways to balance, to, to care for your current members. And this may mean that you look at a way in which perhaps, okay, there's a church named Derrick City, uh, a few miles out of town in Bradford, where I was. And they decided that they were on this pathway, and so they went around as a group to various other churches and looked for another church that would receive them as a group. And they tried two or three churches, and then they came to the church I was serving. And they got welcomed by my people. And they said, this is the place we're going to come as a group. And like 80% of the people in that church joined the church I was serving. And they gave their building to, a, to the uh, Seventh-day Adventists who are, have a wonderful uh, uh, situation going on there. And they became full participants in, the, in where I was. Now, what I'm saying to you is that if your church is on the legacy path, you have to find a way in which to uh, uh, care for your members after your church closes. And that may be finding another pastor in the neighborhood who will say to you, okay, I will care for your shut-ins. I will visit your shut-ins. You know? So that's legacy work. And the last thing is to stop looking for a savior. What you really need in this point is a transitional leader, a person who, like John the Baptist, helps you through that wilderness and says, we're going to care for you during this time. That's, so that's, I know, moving along, that's one exit. Uh, I'll spend a little bit less time on the next two exits, uh, three exits, because this is the hardest one to grasp, I think. And we usually go around it three or four times before we say, yeah, that's the exit for us. Uh, the ex- next exit is Tomorrowland. And this is the exit that's always under construction, you know? There's no certainty as to what will happen once you get off on this exit. But it's the exit that goes towards caring for the next gener- uh, sharing your faith with the next generation. And the thing is, is that about Tomorrowland Pike is that Nothing is for sure. And so it makes it scary. But if you're called, God will be God with you on this path. The third one deals with fully giving yourself in mission. The bills will get paid. The bills will get paid. First thing we want to do is to love the people around us. And uh, this is a toll road. You have to be willing to, uh, to, to risk what you are, knowing that God will provide. And usually what happens is when churches become real missional, God does provide. You know, they're th- because one of the other things about the postmodern generation is they want to have a church that's involved. They don't want to have a church that shirks on their mission giving. Uh, and finally, the best road. Uh, the reason I have the supermarket here with the mustard is that one of the things you'll notice in the mustard aisle and all the aisles in the supermarket, even if you're working in a supermarket, one of the things that they tell you is that the number one brand will sell, will sell half the mustard. 
So French's mustard will sell half the product because it's the number one brand. Uh, the number two brand will sell a quarter, the number three brand will sell an eighth, and all the rest of them will divide the rest. So this is the exit of saying, how can we make our church either the number one brand or the number two brand in the neighborhood? It's the exit of becoming the regional church. And the question that you have to keep on asking yourself if you take this exit is, what is it about our church that will cause people to drive by all the other churches in order to come to ours? And, and that's the quality path. Uh, and by the way, the conference has lots of resources for helping you on this path. Uh, most conferences do. Uh, we don't have as many resources for the other paths usually. Uh, but this is the pathway of quality and choosing that. You see how that works? Uh, you're not going to know tonight what path you belong on. You need to pray about it with others. And this is why I want to tell you that discernment is an important thing for the church to relearn. Uh, we in the church need to learn how to discern the will of God. And that involves getting together with small groups and praying and being open and honest with each other and hearing what God has to say to you in the midst of that, that time. The pastors have their own job. They have peripheral vision problems. Small groups will be the place where the vision takes place. It doesn't come from above. It comes up from the grassroots. Um, so let me ask you, are you willing to commit to spending 40 days with these three questions, wrestling your way through them? This morning I dealt with, uh, dealt with, I spoke with the clergy about transition when we make that movement from one place to another. And what I was hoping is that they have tools perhaps to help that change. But what you need to do is you need to wrestle through the three questions to discern where your church is headed, where is society taking you, what's the nature of church, and don't go for the simple answers. Now, we, we've had too much trouble with the simple answers. So, questions? There are, there are, uh, um, if you just Google postmodern, of course you have to be postmodern to Google postmodern. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of catch twenty two there, but but what's what's interesting is that uh, uh, I guess I've begun to develop a gut level for this. That I, I begin there. There's a list of things that I have elsewhere dealing with marks of the postmodern culture. Some of those I came by uh, reading a variety of stuff. Leonard Sweet has, has stuff. Leonard Sweat has things. Uh, uh, we talk, I mentioned Jim Walker. Uh, Jim Walker is a pastor in our in, in, the, in the Western Pennsylvania Conference who is has really moved along that pathway. Uh, sometimes you have to kind of ask around and think about. It's not always the young people that understand that new culture. Oftentimes, uh, and people, there are people who deal with this as part of their job. You may find in your church a school teacher or a, uh, a uh, person in, in some type of uh, uh, function that involves planning, and they may understand this entirely. Uh, ask yourself what's working. Uh, where do you see something that's, and don't, don't be happy with simple answers as to what's working or why. Sometimes we get cause and effect confused. Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. In that particular church, uh, the Texas Conference provided a full elder with that mission work. Uh, and that may not be a tenable model. In other words, we may have to get back to this is where a traditional church. Are you you're a pastor? Okay. What if you became the person who oversaw the elements being served in a home church? In other words, there may not be anything in it for your church, but if a home church could call upon you to bless the elements, then they would have what it takes. So what I'm saying is that those of us who have sacramental privileges may have to start being more generous in our use of them because every gathering of Christians, I believe, is worthy of, of the Lord's Supper. In other words, I don't think a fellowship should be prevented from having the Lord's Supper just because they don't have an elder. That we, we that those who are, have sacramental privileges have to be generous to the world in that way. Yeah, and what we have to begin to do is we have to think about, okay, uh, we can explain to our people that our bishop is a teaching bishop, or we can explain to our people that uh, uh, the role that Mary has is to build relationships between the churches. In other words, we may have to redefine the role of bishop and DS and such so that it conforms to something postmoderns will realize is important. Oh, yeah, well, we got, uh, <laughs> George, you're over there probably in, in sorrow. George used to work for one of our general agencies. And, uh, and uh, the general agencies are, are, are floundering and hurting because they don't know what their role is. And Okay. Okay. There's a quote. Yeah. The, the, turn the triangle upside down. That's exactly, and that's, that is, yeah, what we saw Jesus doing as he walked through Galilee was he inverted the triangle. Uh, we're trying to out what on earth yeah, and, and to me, and to me, that's wonderful. Missional strategist. You're you're the person who can look at Greenville and say, how can all the Methodist churches of Greenville together be in mission to Greenville? Okay, if they could just free. Yeah. 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 We are in a new world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and frankly, I, I, I'm not so convinced that I, I want to hear very much about the British model because the British Methodist Church has as many problems as we do. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that that's the path that you want to go down. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, yeah. The, you can say a little bit about the multi point charges in existence. Yeah. 
be different. Or, or what, you're, what you're describing would be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This will be the last question. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's, what's different about it is that, uh, well, first of all, it's different in attitude because our current attitude is that the pastor, the, the designated pastor yourself comes from somewhere else into the community and does the things that the people can't do for themselves. You run around. Uh, the new model is going to involve people having a self-sufficient church and you are supervising their ministry. So the more you can bring about the recognition of all the gifts of the church being in the church. And this is hard because I know, you know you, we've, we've trained people not to think this way. We've trained people to think, okay, here's the church, you keep the building up, the pastor will come in and do all the other stuff. Uh, and we have to train them instead to say, they are the fellowship, the supervising person provides guidance and word sacrament order. You're guiding people in terms of the proper way of thinking about the word, the, uh, uh, the proper way of thinking about the, uh, enjoying the sacraments. You're ordering their life together so it's democratic. Or, you know, why we have a discipline is because people don't naturally treat each other well in organizations. They need to have a discipline. So you do that so that they function well. Uh, and then, and, uh, but your job is not any higher than anyone else's job. And you're very functional the way you think of yourself. I, we have tended, to, we, we did an unfortunate thing. We say there are clergy, there are laity, ordained versus lay is some great big separation. Instead of realizing there are Christians and every Christian has a gift and what the church does is gathers those gifts. And we provide a functional person to supervise, not to do the ministry. That's, uh, uh, and I hope this sounds Wesleyan. I, I think uh, it's, it's where it is. Uh, one thing I was gonna mention is that we have gotten really obsessed with buildings. And, and that's what's made your job so fractured, is because you're going between buildings instead of... <laughs> but, but one of the things you have to say to people is, you know, one of the most important things that happened to John Wesley is that when he felt, when he had this wonderful introduction of the spirit at Aldersgate, Shortly thereafter, he found himself preaching out in a field. And it was the outside ministry where he said, the world is my parish, that birthed the Methodist church. Our whole movement comes out of the outside ministry. It's only when we've gotten back into buildings that we've run out of the steam of the Wesleyan movement. So the, the more you can un connect people to their buildings and say the world is our parish again, the better you'll be. That's... Thank you. Oh, thank you. So much. Right. What I'm clear about is that we're in a time of change in our life of our churches, in the life of our communities, in the life of our world. And I believe that we're also in a time of discernment. Um, we do have resources in our conference. You have a congregational specialist, not including myself, but not just myself, who are very good at visioning and planning and these kinds of areas. Um, Bill has got a reality check one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. And his transition uh, workbook, that I believe is going to be helpful, the churches in their life transition. I hope that we will Thank you.